Greetings from the National Archives flagship building in Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Nacotchtank peoples. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual author lecture with Jeremy Dauber about his new book, American Comics, A History. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs on our YouTube channel. This Wednesday, December 15th at 1 p.m., we'll present a program entitled Anti-Federalists and the Bill of Rights. Professors Mary Sarah Builder and Woody Holton will discuss the arguments of the Anti-Federalists and present-day controversies over how we teach the Bill of Rights. And on Thursday, January 6th at 1 p.m., award-winning historian and biographer Kate Clifford Larson will tell us about her new book, Walk With Me, a biography of civil rights leader Fannie Lou Hamer. Cartoons and comic books might not be the first thing to come to mind when thinking about what one can find in the National Archives. However, you can find records relating to 19th century Thomas Nast, creator of the Democrats' donkey and the Republicans' elephant, original drawings by 20th century political cartoonist Clifford Berryman, creator of the teddy bear, and even storyboards for a Superman comic to promote President Kennedy's Council on Physical Fitness. The largest concentration of comic books is in our Center for Legislative Archives. In the 1950s, the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency collected a number of comic books as evidence, including Mad Magazine No. 1. Elsewhere in the National Archives, you can even find Batman in a copyright infringement case and Superman in special issues created for the U.S. Navy. Today, author Jeremy Dauber will tell us about the history of the American comics over the last 150 years. In a review in the New York Times, Michael Tisserand praised Dauber's book, American Comics, as an entertaining and richly detailed new history of comics, a scholarly survey that is both opinionated and frequently funny. And Michael Saylor, writing in the Wall Street Journal, says Dauber's perceptive critical overview is enlivened by a jaunty style that bops from the political cartoons of Thomas Nast in the 1860s to the demise of an equally influential gadfly, Mad Magazine, in 2018. Jeremy Dauber teaches American Studies at Columbia University and is director of Columbia's Institute of Israel and Jewish Studies. His books include Jewish Comedy, A Serious History, which was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. Now let's hear from Jeremy Dauber. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much to uh, Ferio. Thank you to the National Archives. It's a real honor uh, to be here, getting a chance uh, to talk to all of you uh, and to talk about my new book, uh, American Comics: A History. Uh, and you know, one of the, what I tried to do in this book was to say I'm going to take this 150 years of this medium, which was really central in the history of American culture, this American art form. It tells the whole story of American politics and culture uh, in, in, in its own different way and has hundreds and hundreds of masterpieces. I'm going to try and tell this within sort of the body of a single book. Uh, and I wanted to try and sum all of it down uh, in a certain way for the people who came to the National Archives to listen, uh, you know, in less than an hour. Uh, and obviously that would be impossible to do. And if, even if I did it, uh, you know, I, would, I wouldn't leave you wanting more. What I've decided to do is to narrow it down and tell the story of American comics uh, in a very comic book way. And I decided to do that through 10 battles. Right? What are comic books if not full of huge, pulse-pounding, amazing battles? I thought I would tell 10 different stories of comics, the history, through 10 different stories of battles. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to go back close to the very beginning. Not quite, uh, as Mr. Ferriero said, with uh, Thomas Nast, although he's a hugely important part uh, of the story of American comics, really getting it uh, uh, in the minds of all kinds of American citizens in the Civil War era, in the immediate post-war era, but really with the start of American comics as even more of a mass medium. And that comes with the rise of the mass-produced, mass-circulated American newspaper chain. Uh, and in doing that, I want to introduce you to two figures who are the protagonists of our first comics battle. And can we have the first, the next slide, please? These two figures are the people who shaped uh, the American newspaper history as we have it in the late 19th century. And they are on the left, uh, Joseph Pulitzer, 
and on the right, William Randolph Hearst. So these names are probably familiar to many of you who are interested in American history and American culture. Joseph Pulitzer in 1883 uh, bought the newspaper known as the New York World from Jay Gould. By two years later, he had, he had it was selling 200,000 copies uh, a, a day, right? So just this remarkable kind uh, uh, of, of growth. And he did it in a way which was a little bit surprising for those of us who are familiar with the Pulitzer name, uh, really for the Pulitzer Prizes in kind of the most elevated kind of journalism. He practiced what we would now kind of more call a kind of tabloid journalism, uh, if it bleeds, uh, if it leads, and was and always was interested in looking for ways, ways of increasing circulation. Uh, and as a result, he saw this new technological development, these rapid high-speed rotary color presses, and he said, look, you know, at first he thought, I'm going to use these to reproduce great works of Western art. Um, but subsequently he realized, you know what, I really want to sell these comics, uh, these newspapers, excuse me, to a new wave of people who are flooding into the cities to immigrants, uh, to, you know, a backbone of American society, right? But the immigrants obviously coming from different countries. English is not often their first language. Uh, a paper, a newspaper, which is composed primarily of words, not going to be the best, uh, not going to be the best product for them, right? Uh, and as a result, comics became a natural kind of possible circulation booster. And starting in 1895, uh, one character who was called Mickey Dugan, but nobody knew him as Mickey Dugan, everybody called him the Yellow Kid, uh, became prominently featured and became sort of a national merchandising character. And the Yellow Kid really in some ways combined uh, a lot of the features that we now think about as commercial comics. It was an ongoing regular character. It combined word balloons and pictures and text and pictures um, in these sort of fascinating kind of ways. So Pulitzer was doing quite well. And then in that same year that the Yellow Kid uh, appeared in the New York world, we have a new player into the market, sort of the son of a mining, a new mining fortune out west named William Randolph Hearst. Uh, Hearst buys the Morning Journal, another newspaper in 1895, and he and Pulitzer start going at it by producing competing slates of comic strips in these newspapers that would then grow to buy other newspapers in other markets, uh, which would publish their own uh, old comics that belong to these empires of Pulitzer and Hearst. Those groups were called syndicates, probably a name that's familiar to most of you. And many of the comics were either, you know, Pulitzer papers or they were Hearst papers. Hearst would later be known as King Features papers. Um, and Hearst would gather talent kind of the old fashioned way, which is that he would steal it. Right. So many of you may be familiar with the movie Citizen Kane, uh, that, that wonderful movie, which is a thinly autobiographical lead autobiographical picture of William Randolph Hearst and his successes. Uh, and you may remember a scene in which he poaches a lot of different people in that movie. That is basically among those people in the real life version of this were all of the comics creators uh, and editors from Pulitzer's papers, right? So Hearst sort of insta starts, so to speak, uh, his own kind of comics empire. So there was really a lot of competition uh, going back uh, and forth. And in the process of that, and then other syndicates got into it, a syndicate from the Midwest by the, uh, Joseph Middell Patterson, the Chicago Tribune syndicate, created a lot of the indelible comics characters of the first great wave of American comics. And these are names which, while they may not have the, the quite the purchase and the luster as they once did, names like Dick Tracy and Popeye and Little Orphan Annie and Al Cap, all of these names that sound very familiar, I think, to many of us, this was one of the central lingua franca of American culture. And this was something really that transcended class presidents and uh, you know working class people all wanted to know the next adventures uh, of Little Orphan Annie or the Gumps or what have you, right? Uh, it transcended age, right? This was not just a juvenile thing, kids and adults, and it really was nationwide. Uh, a number of anthropologists, cultural observers would say, look, you know what? If you really wanna understand uh, American culture, you really have to understand uh, the comic strips. The left, as I say, is Pulitzer. On the right, as I say, is William Randolph Hearst. So those were the two guys, okay? And the comic strips were the essential basis of uh, American 
uh, comics and American culture, right? This battle that comes out between them and then grows to uh, envelop all sorts of these newspaper slides. Now, can I move to the next slide, please? Um, thank you. So what we have here, right, really is, of course, the next great wave in the history of American comics. And this battle that I would like to call it is Superman versus the bad guys, right? This starts in the late 1930s. You can see the cover date of Action Comics number one right there, June 1938. And what we have here is the brainchild of two Jewish teenage kids from Cleveland who really want to break into that comic strip business. They don't want to make comic books. Comic books in the mid-1930s really is a very sort of kind of second-rate operation. You're putting together, mostly speaking, uh, uh, chopped up and collected collections of comic strips because, after all, yesterday's newspaper is today's fish wrapper. Nobody kept those things uh, particularly. So there was a kind of business in sort of gathering these things together, but that was really kind of a second rate status. Um, Siegel and Schuster really, really wanted to break into the comic strip syndicate business. It was quite lucrative, or at least it could be. And they said, you know what? We want to do this, but nobody was taking Superman. All these newspaper strips passed. All these newspaper syndicates passed on Superman. Uh, and so eventually they had to go to this company, uh, National Comics, which was uh, and then National Comics, which was basically um, putting together what was considered a fairly new idea now in this comic book business, these book of comics business, um, which was an all new collection of material sort of inside these pamphlets. Uh, and originally, I should say, these pamphlets weren't even, uh, no one even had the idea of paying for them. They were going to be given away with buying sort of a new fill up at your gas station or something like that. Um, but according to the story, one of the creators uh, of, uh, of this medium, uh, a guy named Max Gaines, had a couple of these sort of giveaways that were hanging around. And he said, you know, he tried an experiment, which was he stuck a 10 cent sticker on them. Uh, he put them on some newsstands and they sold out. Uh, over the next weekend, and the newsstand dealers were asking for more. Uh, and so these, these, these comic books began to come and sort of develop with them. What end, and, and what really sort of drove that was eventually this character by Siegel and Schuster. Now, I do want to point out that um, if you look at the cover, this is such a famous cover, it's very hard to kind of peel away all of our understandings of Superman. But it's worth pointing out that if you just look at the cover by itself, as you see on the screen, it's hard to tell whether or not Superman is a good guy or a bad guy, right? Here's this random guy. We don't know who Superman is, right? This random guy, he's crashing a car into a rock. People are running away. It looks like out of fear. We have no idea. Maybe they're good guys. Maybe they're bad guys. We don't really know. And that's not surprising because many of Superman's origins started, including from an earlier short story by Siegel, um, as a kind of bad guy. Um, and uh, and he was also supping of a lot of characters from the pulps, from other kinds of things, whose moralities were somewhat ambiguous. Uh, and it's certainly the case that Superman, although from the beginning sort of in the service of a kind of Rooseveltian liberal goodness, right, is very uninterested in what we might call due process, right? <laughs> He's not bringing everybody to the police for arrest and trial. Right. And he's certainly uh, more interested in what we might call justice uh, rather than fairness. Right. And finally, right, his answer to everything is through force. Right. Uh, and all of these points were things that would be very interesting uh, to critics of comic books because this new superhero craze which developed, which became immediately massively popular among the juvenile set, right? This was something that educational sociologists and people who were worried about kids, uh, we became very interested in, um, you know, which was again, not surprising because very soon the amount of money spent uh, on comic books eclipsed all the money that was being spent on books for kids in schools and public libraries, right? So we're talking about a lot, a lot of sales, not just of Superman, um, but of all of these other uh, superheroes or costume characters that were being developed at the time. Now, I will say, I pointed out that Siegel and Schuster were Jewish, and this first wave of superheroes, uh, the vast majority of people who were involved as creators in the industry, not all, but the vast majority, the overwhelming majority, were Jewish. And as a professor of Jewish literature, I'm often asked, you know, what is the connection 
between Jews and comic books. Uh, and I think this is really is in many ways, it's an American story, right? It's a story of a minority group at that time suffering a great deal of social discrimination, not being able to be allowed into uh, certain kinds of elite uh, professions. And so uh, they went to kind of low status uh, professions like as comic books were uh, at the time. And then they hired their friends and relatives, uh, as, as often these communities uh, uh, tend to do, because again, uh, nobody really cared so much about the quality uh, of many of these comics. That's one way in which these comics were very Jewish. Uh, but another way, and now please let's move to the next slide. Another way is that in a period, thank you, in a period of still a decent amount of isolationism, remember that 1938 on the last cover, right? Jews who had a lot of relatives in Europe at this point, many of them were either immigrants themselves or they were first generation, right? They were very, very well aware of Hitler's rise to power and what that meant for the Jews uh, or what that might have meant, what that might mean for the Jews. And so they were very pro war, right? They were very pro getting into World War II, fighting the Nazis before, unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of Americans were. This was before Pearl Harbor. And two other uh, Jewish uh, uh, men, uh, uh, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, came together and they created Captain America, who premiered in Captain America comics, he premiered his own comic right away. This is before Pearl Harbor. Uh, and of course, as you can see, he's giving Adolf Hitler a good right hand socked at the jaw, um, right? Which is, uh, you know, making no bones uh, about where this comic book stood. Uh, and it is fair to say that not everybody was all right with this. Fiorello LaGuardia, the mayor of New York at the time, had to send police uh, to the offices of Simon and Kirby because they received threats uh, after this kind of material was, was being published. So uh, that said, once uh, Pearl Harbor happened, America and its superheroes, its costumed heroes, came into the war with both booted feet. Right, very, very, very active. Uh, all sorts of American heroes uh, uh, fighting uh, in the war. Many new characters coming up, uh, and as you can see on the bottom of the screen, you see that from the very beginning of Captain America, uh, you can see his young ally Bucky. Right, uh, one of the, uh, the 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 audiences for these, in fact, one of the large audiences for these superhero comics, young people by definition uh, were too young to go and actually fight uh, and actually serve in the war, um, but the comics in some ways served as a wish fulfillment for the kids to get involved through these kind of young characters who could serve as sidekicks. And later on, there would be a lot of issues uh, about what exactly, uh, what role these sidekicks had in all this. But at the time, this was one way of getting the kids involved rather than in the case of Superman or Batman or some of these other characters, a kind of metaphorical wish fulfillment of saying, boy, I wish I could be like Superman. Uh, it was easier to imagine yourself as a young kid being a young ally, a boy commando, you know, some of these other kind of boy groups that were in the comic books actually taking the war and being a part sort of of this great enterprise. There were other ways that comic characters got involved too. Uh, characters helped sell war bonds. They helped encourage people to have victory gardens, uh, to pit recycle paper, uh, all of these kind of things that went on. Uh, comics in many ways, certainly from 1941 to 1945, really became uh, a, 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 in, in many sort of fundamental ways, very much a part of the American patriotic uh, war effort. You did not see really in any sort of meaningful way uh, a kind of anti-war movement sort of playing itself out within the comics. That really just did not happen. Okay. So after the war, um, there is this real process of trying to come back. Back is a kind of complicated word here, but trying to res to achieve a certain kind of post-war, I'm putting this in quotes, normalcy. Right. Uh, there were all sorts of social stresses, all sorts of social shifts. Obviously, the fact that so many men went abroad uh, to serve uh, in the armed forces had women taking in that kind of Rosie the Riveter mode that we all know certain kinds of steps uh, in the uh, uh, into the workforce, steps that now were going to be rolled back to a certain extent. Uh, this led and other kinds of things led to a great deal of social stresses. Not everyone came home uh, from the foreign theaters of operation. Uh, there were stresses on families. There were stresses on the children of those families. And many of those stresses 
were playing themselves out, not explicitly, but implicitly, in the rise of a series of genres of comics that uh, gestured at these issues. The most famous of these uh, are three types. The first being romance comics, which were also in some sense created by Simon and Kirby, which kind of had this wish fulfillment of a certain kind of heterosexual white picket fence uh, uh, marriage uh, and sort of a nuclear family as a kind of, uh, uh, again, restoration is not the right word, but a kind of creation, right, uh, in the anxieties of these social stresses. The other two were, roughly speaking, crime comics and horror comics, which in their own ways both suggested, and I don't have time to go into this in great detail, you can see this uh, in great detail in the book that I wrote, um, about the underlying discomfort and trauma uh, and dislocation that, 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 that was under this sort of pretend normalcy, right? That really, if you scratched sort of those white picket fences, you would find all of these noir type criminals and you would find these murderers would be horribly punished in these kind of horrific ways. And the person who is the most associated with that is one of the subjects of our next battle, battle number four. So can we have our next slide, please? Okay, that person, although he looked a little different in the 1950s on our left, the son of that 10 cent sticker guy, this guy's name is Bill Gaines. Uh, uh, and he um, was the, the one of the main, he was the head of, uh, uh, of the company that at first was known as Educational Comics under his father, but was then turned into entertaining comics or ec as everyone knew it okay so ec was really a specialist in these kind of horror comics uh it put together some of these famous ones these names sometimes still have uh uh, uh some resonance now t names like tales from the crypt uh the haunt of fear the vault of horror uh and uh gains was one of these 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 figures sort of responsible for a huge huge wave in these crime and horror comics. Now, I want to remind you, if you were a 10-year-old reading Superman in 1938, by the time it's 1952, it's been 14 years have passed, right? So you're in your mid-20s. Some of people, absolutely, said, you know what? I'm, I'm tired of comics. I'm not going to read comic books anymore. But a lot of people weren't. They just wanted comics that were a little bit older, that were a little bit more uh, suitable to their kinds of interests. Um, this was true of soldiers who were carrying comics at the front. This was true of people who came back. This was true of people who had been on the home front the entire time. And so they're reading these kind of comics. But of course, these comics are available on newsstands. They're available for kids to read. Kids certainly were reading them. Adults were reading them, but kids were certainly reading them too. They were passing them around. Uh, and there began to become a kind of uh, moral concern. And it was led uh, in the popular press uh, uh, by a psychologist named Frederick Wortham, but that led itself in a kind of moral panic to uh, these references, uh, 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 these concerns, I should say, that were being taken up by the United States government, and in no small part by the man on our right, a senator named Estes Kefauver, um, who was, as, uh, the, uh, as David Ferriero suggested in the introduction, responsible for uh, a subcommittee on juvenile delinquency uh, uh, and its role and the role of comic books in perpetuating, in causing, in creating uh, juvenile delinquency. Now, for Wortham, that psychologist, and Kefauver, the hope really was not to outlaw these comics via legal fiat. Um, that would fall afoul of constitutional grounds, uh, and they knew that. But the hope really was to create some kind of very strong incentive for the comic book industry to uh, censor itself uh, along the lines of motion picture ratings codes. Um, and, and this came to a head very famously in the senatorial hearing where Bill Gaines, uh, that character on the left, testified. Uh, and his testimony went extremely badly. Uh, this was in 1954. Uh, and part of this, and there were all sorts of reasons for that, Part of it had to do with the fact that uh, uh, Gaines had taken, this was legal at the time, but he had taken amphetamines to kind of help get himself ready uh, for his testimony. And, was, and then the hearing was delayed and the amphetamines wore off um, and he was kind of crashing. But nonetheless, uh, uh, the hearing went very badly and, and, and distributors and consumers really um, left EC in droves. 
and a lot of the other comics companies seeing the writing on the wall based on this kind of battle. Uh, they also abandoned this kind of model of comics that were a little bit more for adults. They were a little bit more mature and they agreed to be regulated by a kind of comics code, uh, which essentially speaking stunted, I think it's fair to say, the growth of mainstream American comic books kind of kept them uh, uh, in a way that was sort of suitable uh, for newsstands for anybody uh, and everybody to read, which meant even sort of the littlest kids, which meant that they essentially were a juvenile medium. Now, in some sense, Bill Gaines really did have the last laugh. If this idea was to prevent a certain kind of juvenile delinquency, Gaines went on to take one of his comic books, a humor comic book, and recast it as a magazine, um, which was not subject to this kind of code authority. That magazine, of course, went on to become Mad Magazine, um, which then created more juvenile delinquents and anti-authoritarians and countercultural forces than anything I think any of those crime and horror comics would have done combined. So I really do think ultimately uh, that, that Gaines had the last laugh and a very lucrative laugh it was. But comics for, for quite a number of years, for most of the decade of the 50s, maintained really a very juvenile status until the subject of our next battle uh, came. So next slide, please. This is number five. Uh, and these characters, uh, so maybe some are more or less familiar to you. Um, this is in around the 1961. Uh, these two, uh, in, in much younger forms, uh, Stan Lee on the left and Jack Kirby, uh, essentially put their heads together uh, and started to say, you know what, we can create comics still under the aegis of this code authority, but in some sense that instead of looking uh, to really appeal to kind of little kids uh, are, are, are going a little bit more to a kind of an adolescent uh, or a college kind of uh, audience uh, that starts. And those characters become uh, between the two of them, the and also Steve Ditko and a couple of other artists, uh, the, the, the architect of the Marvel Universe that is still appearing very, very prominently uh, on our television and movie screens uh, to, to literally yesterday, to today, yesterday and today. Um, now, the reason that this is a battle is because as people who are familiar with the history of comics know, and maybe it's sort of even, even people who are not, there is a tremendous amount of discord and debate among the players, among the characters, among the critics, as to who created what? What role did each of them have? You might think, or it might have been thought, that because Stan Lee's job involved sort of a typewriter and Jack Kirby's involved uh, uh, more of a brush, uh, that you have uh, the pencils and brushes, that you, that you would have sort of some neat division there, but that is really not the way that comics worked. It's not the way their relationship worked. Uh, for more details, I don't have time to go into this. We can either do it in the Q&A uh, or you can sort of read uh, some of the details uh, in my book. But suffice it to say that along with the creation of this new universe came a kind of discord that led very, to a lot of very bitter, very vitriolic, and also very fruitful conversations about what creativity and originality means in the history of comics. Uh, the general consensus uh, is that Kirby is, uh, who is less known than Stan Lee, who is very much a pitch man for Marvel, uh, Kirby was one of the most, if not the most, fertile and imaginative and creative minds in the history of American comics. So I'm glad to have him as part of the portraiture here, uh, along with Lee, whose face is much better known, uh, for no, not least for his cameos sort of in these Marvel uh, movies. Now, uh, I should say that this, during the 1960s, when the Marvel kind of revolution was hitting mainstream comics, there was another kind of revolution that was coming out uh, as well, among people who had grown up on EC Comics, those, those horror comics uh, on, on Mad Magazine, uh, and who were becoming sort of more and more alienated from what we might call the mainstream of American culture, of American politics. Uh, they were, they were uh, going to college uh, in some cases, uh, as opposed to that first wave of American comics creators. They were becoming increasingly alienated, uh, uh, disillusioned uh, with many of the messages that American mainstream culture was putting out. In short, they were of that generation that was interested in joining this sort of countercultural movement uh, of the late 1960s. Uh, and they themselves, many uh, create uh, a kind of new cultural base uh, 
for the creation of comics. That base is on the West Coast and particularly uh, uh, in the Bay Area. Um, they are a group of people who are interested in using sort of that countercultural sort of uh, uh, motto of personal and free and unfettered expression to create a wide range of comic books. Uh, uh, and many of those comic books take free expression and push it to a, you know, its limits and beyond uh, in ways that strike us now as pornographic, as racist, as misogynist. But also many of these comics uh, are doing something that is entirely new uh, as, a, as a means of personal uh, and indeed autobiographical expression. And I will show you sort of two examples of this in the next slide, battle number six. Next slide, please. Thank you. So here we have two examples uh, of this. Uh, the first on the left is arguably one of the most famous products uh, of this sort of countercultural uh, alternative comics movement. This is the first uh, cover, Zap number zero comics uh, by Robert Crumb. Uh, and you can see that kind of electric excitement, right? Almost like a Tom Wolf thing that is going on uh, here. It plugs you in. Uh, and not surprisingly, many of these comics are also about uh, dropping out, uh, turning on, uh, uh, you know, all of this kind of uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll kind of comics. That, are, that, 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 that very much focuses on much of the underground. It is also, they're also in their own ways, political, but sort of in a, in a kind of broadly speaking mode, but they are often anti-war, are very environmentally focused. Uh, um, and, and as I say, they sort of support pushing back against the norms uh, of the culture. One norm of the culture, however, that Zap Comics, uh, which would later expand not to just to include Robert Crumb, but, but, an, but another six artists, was not interested in expanding was what we might call women's rights, uh, uh, sort of egalitarianism. Uh, women were not invited to be any of the members of the Zap 7. They were frequently not invited to join many of the kind of collaborative comics efforts. Uh, they were being excluded uh, in certain ways. And so uh, many of them came together uh, in other kinds of collectives. Uh, one of the earliest, and I think one of the most famous, is this it ain't me, babe. Comics uh, on your right, and you can see what I think is wonderful here. You can see comic characters from a number of different periods earlier on uh, in comics history, sort of you know giving sort of a, a, a high fisted salute, sort of walking out. Right there's uh, Olive Oil and Little Lulu and Wonder Woman and Mary Marvel uh, and so forth. So you have these characters, and in It Ain't Me, Babe comics, and some of the other comics, one of which is called Women's Comics, um, uh, you see a lot of very powerful uh, this, in the late in the early 1970s autobiographical stories, uh, stories about people coming out, stories about people uh, having uh, being the victims of uh, sexist behavior in the workplace, uh, trying to find their own space for their own personal liberation. Uh, a lot of these kind of stories that are told uh, with with tremendous vigor, uh, tremendous uh, uh, talent and ability, uh, and that and both Zap and It Made Me Babe comics in their own ways would kickstart a whole wave of other kinds of comics that are the seeds of a lot of the graphic novels that we see winning a lot of the awards uh, today. Uh, one of those comic, a younger, a slightly younger member of this generation, this Bay Area generation, was a cartoonist. Uh, whose name was Art Spiegelman, a name that I think is probably familiar uh, to quite a number of you. Uh, Spiegelman would be in the Bay Area. He would then uh, go to Europe. He would learn uh, something about some of the European comics that were flourishing. Then he would come back to New York and he would start along with his partner, Francois Mouly. Uh, he would start a magazine called Raw Magazine, which, which in its own ways, like Zap, Raw, right? You would have sort of a showcase of some of the artistically ambitious, button pushing comics but even as uh, some of those comics were being published, Spiegelman was working on his own project that would be produced as a separate insert within these raw magazine comics that were coming out uh, in the, now we're moving to, into the very early 1980s, uh, a comic book that both used sort of very complicated uh, narrative storytelling techniques, uh, artistic techniques, but also was a uh, complicated uh, uh, autobiographical techniques. It was telling the story not only of Art Spiegelman's father, Vladek Spiegelman, and his experiences as a Holocaust survivor, but also Art Spiegelman's own responses as what we would now call sort of a second generation survivor, 
someone who is the child uh, of Holocaust survivors. Uh, Art Spiegelman was also in that comic trying to make sense, not just of his father's behaviors, his father's history, but also his mother's suicide. Uh, she was also a survivor, but then, then killed herself uh, when Art Spiegelman was a young man. So you have this, uh, this combination. All of this comes together, as, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, in a work which, which Spiegelman called Mouse, uh, uh, it, the first version of which comes out in 1986. If you can have the next slide, please. This is battle number seven, Art Spiegelman versus the New York Times. Uh, as you can see, uh, Spiegelman uh, produces sort of mouse. It's in two parts. The first part uh, you see as a picture on the left. Uh, the second part, excuse me, uh, if you look on the right in the bestseller list, it appears as nonfiction uh, in, in, in the second volume, which comes out in the early 1990s uh, as mouse two. And actually, uh, uh, Spiegelman gets into a little bit of a battle with the New York Times because Obviously, on some level, this is absolutely a true story. This is a true story of Vladek Spiegelman. Uh, uh, Art Spiegelman interviews him extensively. We have the tapes, right? But of course, uh, uh, Vladek Spiegelman did not, and Art Spiegelman don't look like this. They don't have mice heads, right? They don't, they don't have tails, uh, any of these kinds of things. The, the Nazis are not cats and what have you. Uh, and so originally, the New York Times wanted to put this in fiction. And Spiegelman wrote them and said he was very concerned about this because uh, it wasn't fiction, uh, the story, and he was worried that this would give credence and aid uh, and solace to Holocaust uh, deniers. Uh, and so the, the Times agreed to put this uh, on the nonfiction bestseller, on the nonfiction list, uh, which is where it ended up. Uh, and it really gets again to some of these questions, uh, which are present in any autobiography, but I think are much more visual and therefore evident uh, in comics, biographies, autobiographies and, and whatnot uh, about the level of storytelling, of narrativization, of fictionalization that goes on. Mouse did it first. One can argue that it still remains uh, if not the one of a very few high watermarks in the history uh, of these sort of aesthetically ambitious kind of nonfiction sort of storytelling. It comes out, that first part comes out in 1986, the same year of this sort of miraculous year uh, that uh, a, a Batman story, The Dark Knight Returns, and a story called Watchmen come out, which also begin to sort of transmogrify uh, these mainstream comics fully and fundamentally away from being thought at as of as a juvenile medium. No one could read Watchmen and think that this was aimed at little kids. Um, it also becomes, for both Mouse and Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen, they become really released in these cut between hard or cloth covers that could be shelved in bookstores. They could appear very, very beginning in public libraries, right? So you begin to have this real sense uh, of uh, um, how would I put this? This real sense of a beginning of a more elite kind of popular acceptance uh, of this elite and popular acceptance uh, among adults uh, of this kind of material. So uh, that begins to go on at the same time that many of these audiences uh, for let's call them mainstream comic books, they are growing up. They're still staying with this material. And thanks to the new venues of comic shops and comic stores that are really aimed to sell this stuff uh, at higher prices to people with more disposable income, they can buy sort of more grown up versions uh, of this. Uh, and that receives its kind of culmination in a certain of a certain type uh, in uh, the early 90s with the next slide. So can we have that, please? This uh, is this death of Superman uh, that occurs sort of in the early 90s. Uh, you know, as we sort of now kind of know or feel, you know, characters don't really die <laughs> to a certain extent. They, they, they come back. But this actually felt like a huge event. It sold enormously widely. It sold in all sorts of versions. And part of that was not only for, uh, how would I put this, the, uh, the narrative value or the emotional value, though it did remind adults of that emotional connection they had as a kid, but also uh, the idea that people were buying these as speculative or investment kind of properties. So they would sell multiple editions and, multiple, and people would sort of buy these as investment properties. Uh, and that really develops a kind of sense that hasn't really ever quite gone away uh, from the comics market, um, which also led increasingly to these kind of event driven sagas, right? Everything is now huge. Superman dies, this character dies, this universe explodes. Uh, and with each of these, in some ways, one of the concerns is that this battle, this kind of battle approach, makes things a little less special each time. With each time, there's sort of a multiversal crisis uh, 
we take it a little bit less seriously. Right. So in some ways, the comics, the, the mainstream comics business was being concerned in certain ways about this kind of uh, uh, relevancy and purchase, even at the moment of one of its biggest victories. But at the same time that those kind of things were happening, a new revolution was beginning. Uh, and I'm going to turn to the next slide. The battle of what I call Black Panther or Marvel Comics, you could say, versus conventional wisdom. Uh, and the conventional wisdom, starting about 10 years ago, um, was that uh, you could not really make a very, uh, 20 years ago, I should say, was that you could not very ma make a very successful uh, comic book movie. Uh, with very, very few exceptions, the, super, the first Superman movie with Christopher Reeve, that first Batman movie, but it was going to be very hard to make kind of uh, an aesthetically successful uh, and commercially successful uh, a movie. Uh, they, they, no one had really cracked that code. Um, and they certainly hadn't uh, uh, really uh, been able to do this in the way that uh, gave some real mad sense of the magic of these mainstream comics, which was these sort of grand panoramas with lots of different characters that sort of went back and forth from different things. Uh, and then Marvel Studios sort of developed as a studio. They began uh, uh, to sort of unravel all of these rights questions that, that they had had. They made these terrible deals where they sold sort of many of their flagship characters, uh, the rights to, to different film studios. Um, uh, and they started with Iron Man uh, and continued to sort of build uh, under the leadership of this guy, Kevin Feige, this sort of uh, Marvel universe, uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe that really sort of had this kind of enchantment and this magic. This was aided by, uh, in many ways, the development of special effects, a special digital effect to allow for a kind of uh, presentation of that awe uh, on the screen that you hadn't had before. Right. Uh, and also uh, with that concomitant expansion came the possibility uh, of telling different kinds of stories from different kinds of corners uh, of the Marvel Universe. Uh, and in fact, there was an interview with the producer of Black Panther uh, a couple uh, a little bit before it came out. Um, and the concern was raised that maybe people would not go to see <clears throat> a movie uh, in which uh, the characters uh, were not looking like so many of the superhero characters that had graced the screen before, which was to say white people, right? And this producer who was black said, look, you know, I think of this as the Fast and Furious movies, uh, the movies which were very successful. Uh, they have a multi-ethnic cast. People did not come to see the multi-ethnic cast. They came to see the cars. They came to see all the car chases. People are going to come to Black Panther for uh, for that, um, and they're going to stay for sort of how good a movie it is. For the superhero aspects, they're going to stay to see how good a movie it is. I think that it ended up not being quite true that the only reason people came was because uh, of the superheroing thing. There was a real appeal to seeing a story being told that looked different from a lot of the stories before, but it did not hurt that it was a tremendously accomplished movie on many different grounds. Of course, uh, as probably everyone who is here knows, it was enormously commercially, aesthetically successful, uh, successful sort of really on every ground. Uh, and and uh, again, really overturned conventional wisdom and really paved the way for a very welcome development of having a lot of corners of the Marvel Universe to be explored, uh, boosted, reinvented, uh, restructured uh, in ways that really reflect sort of a very welcome diversity uh, there. So, so that kind of conventional wisdom, I think, is in the process uh, hopefully uh, uh, of being overturned. But there's one last battle that I want to sort of talk about before we get to the questions and answers. Uh, and for that, I will have the next slide, which is that if you've noticed, the last, let's say, half of our battles have really been battles that have been fought in the adult audience, among the adult audience, that adult range uh, of, uh, of comics. And when we started our story, it really was a story about kids, mostly speaking. And juvenile materials. And so for a while, it might have well been asked, are comics still possible for kids? Does the maturation of this medium mean <clears throat> that there aren't uh, comics left for kids? And I am, as many of you may know, I am here to delightfully inform you and delightedly inform you that that is not the case. Yes, we have comics like Batman's The Dark Knight Returns, which are very much dealing with very grim and gritty and dark and adult and psychologized themes. Um, but we are also seeing a, a real renaissance in comics for kids, often, although not always, 
between sort of hard covers, things like Dav Kapilke's Dogman, uh, things like Raina Telgemeier's comics. Uh, um, so we have just a wide variety uh, of materials for people of all ages. And just to end on a quick autobiographical note, you know, when I was a kid, uh, uh, you know, you could go to a public library, you could look for comics, as I did. You couldn't find really almost anything, any collections of comics. Now, of course, they're everywhere. You know, you would never have found them in school libraries at all, even the sort of the limited collections they are. Now, again, uh, they're everywhere. And I see my kids, I have little kids sort of reading these things, loving these things, uh, just a new generation sort of being enchanted with different comics in different ways, but that same medium uh, and long may it continue. So I'm going to stop there uh, with my 10 battles. That is the 10, 10 final battle, although I'm sure there are more. And to uh, thank you. And to uh, that, that is that is the book. Uh, and I'm going to take some of the questions uh, uh, that, that, that are, are being sent uh, over to me uh, from the YouTube chat. The first question, uh, I, I think, is, you know, does this book make a great gift for friends or family members in this holiday season? <laughs> Maybe I added that one. Um, but of course, the answer is yes. Uh, yes, it does. I think that, uh, you know, there, everybody here, as I think you can see, has some connection with comics. Uh, uh, I, I really hope that it's a sort of fun story uh, of these comics. I think it would be fun for everybody. But now I'll get to the to the real ones. Um, can you explain the motivation between comics directed towards adults or children uh, is the first question that I, that I have. And I think that, uh, you know, that's a great question because it gets to questions of uh, motivation uh, and it gets to questions of audience. So there are different kinds of people who are in the comics, who, who make comics or make certain kinds of comics, primarily for the purpose of meeting a market need, right? And depending on that market, right, that, that could be aimed towards children uh, or adults, right? Uh, if you're writing a Walt Disney comic, uh, you know, the odds are that you're, you're aiming this for kids. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, while you may make it in the way that uh, Carl Barks did with his Donald Duck stories, uh, appealing for adults as well, you know, you're very mindful of that audience. Uh, if you're Dav Pilkey, you know, adults may have a, a fun time reading this with their kids, but it's really aimed at kids. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you are writing a kind of grim and gritty Batman series, you know that there's an adult a set of audiences out there uh, 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 who are very interested uh, uh, in, in, in hearing sort of a grown up Batman story, a kind of, that would would be too terrifying or too whatever for kids. Uh, I think also that, you know, those stories can have within themselves uh, in different ways, uh, different kinds of aesthetic ambition. Um, so there are certain kinds of stories, whether they be superhero stories or science fiction stories or romance stories or autobiographical tales uh, that are want to get into issues uh, and want to be told in ways that really are not appropriate for children. And I mean that not just in terms of the content, but also in sort of the way of storytelling and, and sort of the way that it's described. And that I think, really uh, also is now uh, effectuated by really a wide different variety of media and venues in which to tell those stories, not least uh, the internet, right? That you can sort of put up your, on your own website, you can put up comics uh, and no one really is gonna stop you for, or can't stop you from doing that. Um, but there are others as well. You can produce them in a book and have them published, uh, uh, et cetera. So those two things, and I talk about this in the book, those two things really have existed in different ways uh, all through uh, kind of comics history. Uh, all the way back, some of those comic strips really were not designed primarily for kids, even though they appeared in the same section uh, as of it. Um, moving on to what about comics for minorities is a great question. Uh, one of the stories that I think is hugely important to tell in the book, and I, and, and I do, right, is the way that certain groups, uh, their stories are not told uh, in comics or they're told in very caricatured ways. Uh, and the efforts by those groups to uh, reclaim, to claim, to tell uh, kind of their own stories uh, or and or to be part of sort of these these larger franchises, these larger kind of companies and what have you. These are very important. And, and this happens in, in, in different ways all through comics history from different syndicates, which really specialized in comics by women or by black people, uh, by different kind of independent comics, like the one I talked about, that it ain't me, babe comics, by attempts like the Milestone Universe, the Dakota Universe, sometimes it's called, in the 1990s to try and create a kind of suite of superhero comics, uh, by comics, by uh, uh, Hispanic or Latinx uh, indivi uh, you know, individuals and creators, uh, uh, sometimes in sort of similar companies. I, I tell a lot of these kind of stories in the book. And again, thankfully, 
we are also at a time where uh, the, the, the pool of people uh, of all kinds of different ethnic backgrounds, all kinds of different backgrounds, um, uh, who are participating in sort of the grand storytelling uh, um, uh, uh, machineries of our time really is increasing. Maybe it's not as increasing as fast as all of us would like, but it certainly is increasing. Uh, and we are getting to, uh, to to hear more of those stories, I think, which is great. Um, I think uh, uh, one other question that's coming up uh, is one about collectible comics. Uh, and I think that that's a, one of the very, very interesting questions about comics as an institution, as a business, as opposed to an artistic medium, right, or, or, or a storytelling medium, is the way that comics have become a kind of business franchise. It's fair to say that when, um, you know, comics start sort of first in the newspaper strips, they start in the early comic book days. Um, it's very clear that nobody thought of these as items to be preserved uh, or to be collected. One of the things, for example, that um, you see, in, you know, obviously in very early comics uh, is, you know, rip this page out of your comic book uh, and it's suitable for framing, right? If you uh, take this, you know, take the staples out and sort of recycle the paper, those kind of things uh, in those early days. Uh, as time, and, and, and of course, uh, as time went on, you had people, you know, be, you know, continuing to say as they grew up, we love these comics. We're going to preserve these comics. We're going to swap them at early conventions, right before the internet, right? The, the comics conventions really were places for people to sort of trade and swap comics. You begin to have something like the Overstreet Price Guide, which then sort of makes a market uh, for these for these comics, sort of saying this is actually what these comics are worth. That really establishes these things. And then, as I said, with that death of Superman, you really begin to have the companies sort of realize how much money they can make a, 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 on these sort of comics as not just sort of uh, very popular things that might sell a lot of copies to read, but investment properties. And so they say, you know, we're going to release six editions uh, of this comic, this special comic. You know, they're in different covers and they have different kind of fancy shtick attached with them. And we assume some of them are already bagged. Right. Uh, they're already put into bags, sort of pre-sold that way. We don't expect you to be reading this. We expect you just to, to sign this. I mean, one of the things you see now is that very frequently when comics, very old and rare comics come <clears throat> uh, on sale, they're already kind of in, sealed in this kind of like lucite block. They really are not. Nobody thinks that you're going to open them. Nobody thinks you're going to do anything but preserve them uh, under under glass, so to speak. So, uh, you know, so that that is really a very kind of different thing. And the and, and, and the market in these comics, the market in original art, you know, these are going for prices that none of the creators ever could have imagined. And in many, many cases, and this gets to a very important question, you know, many of these artists or those original creators would never be able to afford. Uh, uh, and, and, and so that question of creators rights, creators, money, that's another story that I tell in the book. Very important. Uh, I think I'll end with one final question uh, here, which is, what do you think is the future uh, of comics? Uh, and and, and I, I think that's a really important question. And, and I'm, I'm, maybe it's not surprising, but I'm very bullish uh, on the future of comics for two particular reasons uh, um, uh, in two different ways. The first, as I alluded to before, really is the way that the internet uh, has provided a really vast canvas uh, for democratization of the comics medium. So for many, many decades, if you were really working in mainstream comics, even to a certain extent, although less in alternative and independent comics, you really had to be very geographically uh, uh, located in, in, in just a couple of places for a long time for mainstream comics, it was New York City, in order to get the assignments, in order to be noticed, in order to do that kind of thing, which is very hard otherwise. Um, that is not the case anymore. If you draw your comics probably on a digital tablet now, right? If you draw your comics, you put them up there, um, you know, and you get a million, you get 5 million views, someone is going to notice, someone is going to come calling. Uh, and it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter who you are. If you've got the goods, you know, you are findable and you're valuable in that kind of way. That's going to pay, I think, huge dividends uh, already is for the kinds of talent that the industry gets, the kind of stories that the industry is willing uh, uh, to tell. So, so that I'm very, very uh, excited about and very bullish about. I think also that uh, in terms of the, the future of, of comics, you know, growing up, as I said, you would not have seen comics uh, sort of accepted uh, in schools, in public libraries, in bookstores, in the way that they are now. I don't think that's going away. I can't sort of see a story in which that goes away as a medium. Obviously, there are particular 
titles that might constantly be under question, uh, uh, this and that, but as a medium, I think that's there. So I think it is woven inextricably into uh, the life of American culture. I mean, the fact that I'm here uh, at the August uh, National Archives, uh, uh, you know, telling uh, and having, uh, you know, the National Archivist of the United States talking about comic books. Again, that's something that, you know, 20 years ago uh, would have been hard to imagine. So it, it, it's really, uh, uh, the comics are here to stay. Uh, I think their future is bright. And I want to thank particularly uh, 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 David Ferriero and the National Archives and all of you for your time and your attention. Thank you all very, very much.